A Love Supreme came in the middle of the 60s and, and really distilled the decade's themes of universal love and spiritual consciousness. It was one man's private vision and yet had such a universal impact. Now, almost 40 years later, it has proved to be far more important than just a record and has really reached far beyond just jazz listeners. John Coltrane was one of the few people on the planet advanced enough spiritually to have complete empathy, which is the most elusive of the human emotions to attain. Complete empathy with what was going on around him. And he could see the world. And this music is a reflection of that empathy. And it is something to aspire to, spiritually, personally, and musically. John Coltrane's Love Supreme, a beautiful and deep record to listen to. For some, it's not easy sometimes. There's a lot of intensity there. But that sound is so passionate, so sincere. Coltrane on tenor sax, McCoy Tyner on piano, Jimmy Garrison on bass, Elvin Jones on drums. A perfect match, perfect team. Coltrane was the leader, but everyone put the music first. Many people who never listen to jazz have heard Love Supreme. It's one of those rare pieces of art that transcends an idiom or a time or a space. It's one of those pieces of art that starts as a personal statement. And so many others have found something of themselves in it, myself included. It's a private connection, one that's hard to describe or put into words. It's almost as hard as describing how the music sounds. You just have to hear it for yourself. In the next hour, Coltrane's friends and family and Coltrane himself help us to understand who he was and how he came to create such a beautiful and lasting statement. We'll get a little closer to John Coltrane and the making of A Love Supreme. I'm Most Deaf. For saxophonist Branford Marsalis, Love Supreme was Coltrane's defining moment as an artist. It's something when I was a kid, uh, there was a friend of mine named Kermit Campbell. He was a, the piano player in my band called The Mighty Creators. And we would always talk about pop bands that we liked, and they would make a record. And then we would say, well, that's it. It's all downhill from there. And we would argue. And I remember Earth, Wind & Fire did a record called All In All. And when I heard that record, I said, well, that's it. It's all downhill from there. And uh, Kermit said, no, man, they got stuff left. And every record they made after that, it was all going to be downhill, like a band gets to a goal. And then when you get there, that's it. And I think uh, John knew that. You know, probably heard the tapes. He said, we ain't going to never sound no better than this. And now it's time for me to reinvent myself again because he had done it three times. I mean, not many musicians have done that. Branford Marsalis is one of the many musicians who has tried playing a love supreme with his own group. Seems easy. Four musicians, strong melodies, clear structure. But that's only a part of what Coltrane put into the making of A Love Supreme back in 1964. Uh, the essence of A Love Supreme, uh, the, particularly the first movement, but I think the essence of all of his, uh, his experience is the blues. And that is the X factor. If you don't really have an understanding of the blues and how it functions in jazz, you're going to have a tough time playing pieces like A Love Supreme. The bass line is actually, you know the song, uh, the Muddy Waters song, Seven Sun? On the seven hour on the seventh day. You know, yes, you do. On the seventh hour, da 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 da. On the seventh day, da 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 da. You listen to the bass line. That's do de do de. It's the same notes. 
Well, that's what makes Train so great, is that he came through the whole spectrum of, of, of the music. You know, he played in Navy bands. You know, that's one kind of music. His father was a preacher. You know, that's another kind of black music. John Coltrane Quartet recorded Love Supreme in December of 1964, but the story started in the late 50s. Poet Mary Baraka was right in the middle of it. Then the whole rhythm and blues thing, you know, and, and walking the bar, the stomp down R&B funk. Uh, and so Train has part of that in it. He, in other words, he has a little bit of the Earl Bostic, but I'd say also a little bit of the, of the kind of Big J McNeely screaming and crying in him, because that all comes up just before that, in the 50s. You see Jay McNeely falling on his back, you know, playing on his back, kicking his heels in the air. So that kind of uh, complete, absolute expression. And so the whole thing about walking the bar was it was it was a kind of entertainment. That was all. It was you could get closer to the audience, but also actually that walking the bar I think stirred up a kind of a uh, you know a deep emotional kind of thing. So everybody wanted to walk the bar. They couldn't all walk the bar, but they would definitely demonstrate that emotional kind of uh, connection to that music. It was a the direct transfer of that uh, blues kind of cry, you know, into the saxophone that brought the 50s. And so then later you get people like, say, uh, the train. Uh, all they're doing is carrying that kind of motif into, you know, another kind of uh, context. Benny Golson would know because you could tell, yeah, you should talk to Benny because um, because he saw and heard train do it. <laughs> yeah, he, he got a job up at a place called the Ridge Point. It was a street where three streets crossed instead of two. Yeah. And so this, where the club was, was almost like a big slice of pie. And the bar was made in the same shape. And they usually start at the big piece of the pie and walk down to the point and then up the other side. And I said, uh, I can't believe that he's playing there because this is a rock and roll place. And, you know, the honkers play there. So a Saturday afternoon, I decided to go there. And as I opened the door, he was on the bar and right at the point of the pie. And I, he looked in my face and I fell up against the door laughing. And he took the horn out of his mouth and said, oh, no, because I caught him on the bar. <laughs> Train was a late bloomer on the scene. He was almost 30 when Miles Davis asked him to join his quintet. Coltrane made some great music with that group. fired Coltrane. He was slipping. Train's heroin habit started messing with his playing. Trey lay low for a while, kicked the habit, and got back on the scene. In 1957, he joined legendary pianist Thelonious Monk, one of my favorites, at the Five Spot Club. That's when he got his music and his life together. <laughs> Thank you. 
Coltrane writes about coming clean in the notes of Love Supreme. He said, In 1957, I experienced by the grace of God a spiritual awakening which was to lead me to a richer, fuller, more productive life. Ashley Kahn just wrote a book about a Love Supreme. He sees the connection. The titles of the movements in the suite itself, Acknowledgement, Resolution, Pursuance, Psalm, it all suggests the stages of a progress towards salvation. A Love Supreme was years away, but Coltrane's progress was fast. He hooked up with Miles again, and you can hear a new urgency in his sound. He played on records that would revolutionize jazz, like Kind of Blue. It wasn't long before Coltrane started looking to form his own band. Here's John Coltrane. Uh, I have, an, I have uh, several men in mind, but I haven't selected the side men yet. You know? I'm going to well, try with like the quartet. Would you feel like working with uh, a, a quartet? Yeah, to begin with, and maybe in uh, several weeks after I start, I might add a fifth man. Brand from Marsalis. It wasn't like, you know, I'm going to call whoever's available and whoever will do the gig. I mean, that's something he probably, if he didn't have it, he definitely learned it from Miles because Miles was the king of that. I think what Miles' uh, uh, best, his strongest suit was always been his ability to identify personnel and find the people who worked perfectly for what it was that he wanted to do. And very few musicians had the, the, the patience, the time, or the skill to do that. I mean, you know, you hear some of these records Charlie Parker's playing with. I mean, it's not his fault. I mean, if you think about it historically, uh, the instrumentalists were just technically, conceptually way ahead of the rhythm sections at that time. The rhythm sections hadn't caught up to what was going on. By the time the, 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 the 50s rolled around, it started to level out a little bit. But Miles was always, he could pick the guys that, that were going to work within his structure. And, 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 and John Coltrane had that as well. I mean, he knew the guys. He didn't know who they were, but he knew when he heard the sound, that's the guy I want. That's the guy I want. And that's the guy I want. And that, that is a, but one of the greatest examples of structure that you can think of. Pianist McCoy Tyner was the first to join. I had met John when I was 17, so I knew him. I met him in 55, in between his, the first and second period with Miles. He came home to stay with his mother. But um, he told me, he says, whenever I leave Miles, I want you to join my band. Because, uh, you know, I played with him a couple of times. Um, I remember when he was writing Giant Steps and Countdown. I was sitting on his mother's porch, and he was showing me, you know, you know what he was doing. And uh, then he, he I wanted to record him because I had played that music, you know. But he used to me. I was too young. I was like 17, you know, 18 years old. I know you can play, but you're young. McCoy remembers how drummer Elvin Jones got involved. It's amazing how everything fell in line in terms of personnel. We finally settled on the right combination of people. I think that we all had unique personalities. We brought that to the table. You know, he knew that he had good people because I was in the band before Elvin, and he told me about Elvin. He said, I think he'd be a great drummer. I said, yeah, I'd heard of Elvin, but I didn't really know much about him. He needed a different kind of approach. And I, th I think that's why I was looking for Alvin with a freer kind of feel, the rhythmic polyrhythm thing going on, and you know what I mean? But conceptually, things were changing. You know, things were changing. And uh, Alvin fit that bill. He came in and did a fabulous job. We were, we were very compatible musically. You know, John was able to, to, to see that. By 1961, Coltrane had a hit. His version of My Favorite Things was a huge success.
It wasn't the sound of music, but it was the sound of Coltrane's music. A sound that never rested because Coltrane was always on the move, always searching. You're listening to the making of A Love Supreme. I'm Mo Stuff. By 1961, My Favorite Things was a huge success. He could have quit music that year. We'd still be checking out albums like Blue Train. Giant Steps. Instead, the pieces finally fell into place for what's called his classic quartet. After McCoy and Elvin came the bassist Jimmy Garrison. I was playing uh, with Ornette at the uh, uh, five spot, the old five spot, and uh, uh, John and uh, Eric Dolphy happened to come by uh, that night and I said, uh, So uh, when it was over, uh, Coltrane asked me if I decided to leave Ornette to. Uh, uh, he'd like to have me in his band. Or not, would never let the bass... Usually, when you go to a, a, a club or, or a concert, you usually see the bass in the background, you know, taking up its uh, company chores, so to speak. But uh, Ornette uh, decided that uh, the bass was more than just an accompanying instrument. It was, a, uh, it was one of the main voices in whatever piece of music you were playing. And uh, when... Uh, I joined Coltrane, I carried that concept with me. Coltrane had taken Ornette Coleman's bassist, but it wasn't out of disrespect. Coleman's music hit Coltrane hard when he heard it. To train, it was a new, very attractive way to approach composing. Train's earlier songs were all about the harmonies, and he'd make a set of rules for himself and fit the melody of the song inside of them. It sort of sounded like this. He took lessons from Ornette Coleman on how to write music that began with melodies, and that gave his music an open feeling. John Coltrane. To write melodically is uh, really the best way because then you are not governed by just a set rule here, set rule there. It takes in everything, you know. And uh, it's much more flexible and more far-reaching for me to write like that than it is just to write from a harmonic basis. But now that I'm trying to write from the melody first, uh, the melody will be more important. And so eventually I um, may uh, derive some melodies which are, uh, of, uh, maybe have uh, some quality or some lasting value of some sort.
When you compose with the melody in mind, that's also what you think about most when you take a solo. John Coltrane. Yeah, I think uh, I'm going to let the nature of the songs that uh, determine just what I play. So that's why I'm concentrating around uh, developing the ability to write. And then after I write, uh, I'm going to take the nature of the songs and just play them as I feel them. And this might call for any type of playing. It might be modal, it might be chord progressions, or it might be uh, just all areas. In other words, I think that every piece of music uh, demands a, a certain type of interpretation, just by the nature of the song itself. And that's what I'm going to uh, try to make myself, mm -hmm. allow myself to be governed by, just mm -hmm. what I feel the song calls for. Ashley Kahn wrote The Making of a Love Supreme. By the early 60s, Coltrane would take the kernel of a melodic idea. In fact, he consciously did this. He really wanted to take just the seed of an idea and develop it within an improvisational episode. And this is the way classic recordings came about, impressions, tunes such as that. And this was only possible because he had spent decades with dedicated practice, dedicated studying of his horn. In fact, his technique had become such an innate part of his psyche that it literally flowed out of him. His wife, Naima, during the 50s, tells stories about him falling asleep with the horn still in his mouth. Train was really incredible on the horn, but he didn't get there overnight. He practiced so much, it's become something of a myth. Not to Cold Train's cousin, Mary Alexander, who saw and heard all of it. You know, it just sounds very strange to, for someone to say that a person practices all the time. But he did. He, you know, all his waking hours, he got up practicing. And he did all the things that he had to do, which it wasn't very much, because he certainly wasn't going to do any work at all, you know. And so he... Uh, he practiced. So we just learned how to just walk right over John while he practiced. John practiced so much in that little apartment that we lived in that the neighbors complained about it. And by that time, we had joined a small church in the neighborhood. You know, our family had joined this small AME Zion church. And the pastor of the church gave John the keys to the church so he could practice in the church and not disturb, disturb the neighbors. <laughs> Powerful image, John Coltrane in an empty church playing saxophone for hours on end. Not that he was out of place in the church, both of his grandfathers were ministers. Train showed his curiosity for religion early on. You know how they opened the doors of the church? They, you know, come if anyone wants to join church. And uh, I remember once, I don't know how old we were, but John did that one time. They opened, he uh, walked up to join the church, and I couldn't even understand what he was doing or anything. Didn't know whether he did or not.
Train wasn't just religious, as they say he had religion, though it was a very personal thing. He never pushed his beliefs on anyone, but he always pushed himself and his music. McCoy Tanner. And the group reached many peaks, uh, many levels. Uh, we had, uh, when we would reach a certain point, John would want to move on to something else, and then we'd do that, and we'd, it's almost like, uh, we would conquer certain things that, that we were after. We had goals. I mean, under his leadership, you know, we, you know, we would move to different places and develop that idea and move to something else. And it was an ongoing venture. He was always ahead of himself, you know. In other words, he, would, uh, he was hearing change taking, taking place. But he wanted it to happen now, not next month, next year, you know, he, you know was like, he was a now kind of guy, you know, like, and he worked hard to make sure now arrived as soon as possible, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean. By the early 60s, John Coltrane was checking out Eastern philosophies, religious books, and music from around the world. He wrote songs called Spiritual, India, and Africa, poet of Mary Baraka. You're talking about trained and trying to take a, a non-Western aesthetic you know, but also to uh, invest that with a deeper kind of uh, singular understanding of what would bring, say, serenity, peace, all those things that he gives, that it had to go outside of the Western paradigm, because the Western paradigm was full of what? Uh, lynchings, the Ku Klux Klan, war, imperialism. So he began to focus on what he thought were uh, spiritual kind of experiences that were uh, more authentically spiritual or deeper than, say, uh, the Western kind of religious paradigm. Change was in the air, and for John Coltrane, it was just the beginning. You're listening to the making of A Love Supreme. I'm most of. Major support for this program comes from the J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation, the Geraldine R. Dodge Foundation, and WBGO-FM. Contributors include the Verve Music Group, home of the deluxe edition of A Love Supreme in record stores everywhere. Thanks also to Viking Books, publishers of Ashley Kahn's A Love Supreme, the story of John Coltrane's signature album. This is the making of A Love Supreme. I'm most deaf. trying to do this to make it better. In any situation that we find in our lives, when there's something that we feel should be better, we must exert effort to try to make it better. It's the same socially, musically, politically. John Coltrane certainly followed his own advice when he played saxophone. He'd always taken long solos, but in the early 60s, they started to get very long. It was like he was searching for something and he knew he would find it on his horn with enough time and concentration. Dan Morgenstern is the director of the Institute of Jazz Studies at Rutgers University in Newark, New Jersey. He saw a training play in the early 60s. They played without stopping for almost an hour, for 50 minutes, you know, and the intensity of that that was ecstatic. It was just 
unbelievable. I mean, you could not resist that. I mean, it was like being in a heightened state. You know, you we were totally unaware of anything else. Jazz had never really sounded like this before. The critics didn't know what to make of it, and it came at a time when the country was divided as well. Cold Chain, a black artist pushing the boundaries, people were very quick to draw a connection between the music and the politics. You see, a lot of people try to politicize our music. Like, like it was like, that's what all we were thinking about is politics. I mean, I, I, never, I never looked at it like that. McCoy Tanner. I'm, I'm not saying we weren't affected by what was going on, because it was all it's in the newspapers, it was on TV. I mean, we had to see people marching and riding. I mean, and not only that, I mean, there were people talking and trying to come come together and make things happen um, as as a nation coming together and working on its problems. But um, you know, so you you're going to be affected to a degree. But then a lot of people figured, well, you know, because he was experimenting, the band was experimenting on things that we were rebelling against you know, tradition, you know. And I don't think John was necessarily, maybe it was some things he didn't like, you know, but I don't think he was out there trying to like, you know, rebelling against this, rebelling against that. Dan Morgenstern was a writer for Downbeat Magazine. He had seen firsthand how race relations had changed the jazz world as well. Anything that had to do with the avant-garde was perceived by certain members of the jazz audience as having a political implication. One of the, I think, most complex aspects of this whole question, as far as jazz is concerned, is that to many white people in the jazz world, musicians, fans, writers, who had a long-time commitment to integration who, needless to say, if they were serious and knowledgeable, were very much aware of interaction between black and white in the jazz world, and by extension of many of the things that were wrong with American society in terms of race relations. However, all of us underestimated the amount of unspoken underlying anger about many, you know, years, decades of injustices of all kinds. It came to the surface and it shocked a lot of people. Critics had no idea how to take this racial tension or what to say about it. Instead, they saw evidence of it everywhere, including Coltrane's music as it developed in the early 60s. When you hear Coltrane in the group experimenting, it could feel like an attack if you're not used to it. John pulled an aggressive, loud sound out of his tenor, but that didn't mean he was an angry person. Say, oh, well, they uh, seem to think that it's an angry sort of thing. It's real. Some of them do, I don't know. But do the critics feel, here. Do you feel angry? No, I don't. Uh, I was talking to a fellow today, and I told him that uh, the reason I play so many so many, uh, it sounds, maybe it sounds angry because I'm, I'm trying so many things at one time, you see. Like, I, I, I haven't sorted them out. I have a whole bag of things that I'm trying to work through and get the one essential, you know. Every artist relates to what's happening around him. If, if his music is going to be effective, if it's, if it's going to be meaningful. McCoy Tanner. You can go back to Europe, you know, the, the, the wars they had over there, they had social upheavals and all sorts of plagues. And people wrote music around stuff like that because you have to be connected to the reality of life. It's not that you, uh, you, 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 you're waving a flag. The Civil Rights Movement was the biggest thing going in terms of an actual movement for fairness and 
decency. But there are always some people who take it to the extreme. That's just the way it is. You know, I mean, like the, the weathermen, the, the, this, this group, that group. But I'm just saying that uh, we were all affected by, by that. And I think the, the, the uh, uh, song Alabama came from a uh, speech. Alabama was the first openly political song that Coltrane had written. On September 15, 1963, four young girls were killed by a bomb at the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham. Martin Luther King wrote a solemn memorial speech for the girls. Coltrane read the speech the next day and wrote a moving soundtrack to it. These children, unoffending, innocent, and beautiful, were the victims of one of the most vicious and tragic crimes ever perpetrated against humanity. And yet they died nobly. They are the martyred heron of a holy crusade for freedom and human dignity. That death says to us that we must work passionately and unrelentingly for the realization of the American dream. And so, my friends, they did not die in vain. God still has a way of wringing good out of evil. And history has proven over and over again that unmerited suffering is redemptive.
Coltrane had seen both Martin Luther King and Malcolm X speak. Here's Alice Coltrane. It was very interesting in the civil rights movement. Um, I would imagine his philosophy would be closer to Martin Luther King. Let me try to reach your heart and your spirit and your soul. Then we can move together uniformly as a people and we can accomplish great things. The Civil Rights Act, the beginning of the Vietnam War, there was a lot happening in America during the summer of 1964. Coltrane and the quartet had just finished touring the country in train station wagon. The band got better and better on the road. When they came home, they took a break. Train had fallen in love with the pianist, Alice McLeod. She was having his child and he was buying a home for his new family. Coltrane took a moment to reflect and the result was Crescent. After several years of very steady work, the band had given Train many new ideas. Coltrane took that inspiration upstairs to his studio, a place where he would do most of his composing. He spent five days there working on new music. When he came down, Alice Coltrane saw a change in him. There was that joy, that peace in his face, that tranquility was there. So I said, tell me everything. We didn't see you really for a while. And uh, he said, this is the first time that I have received all of the music for what I want to record. When Train said received, that meant he knew what he was going to do. He had an idea of how it should sound, and he left the rest to his band. It was very spontaneous, you know. I tried to uh, not only give a skeleton, a uh, framework for a song, and uh, from then on, it's up to them to create their own uh, parts to it. And that way is much better, you know. It shapes, it sort of shapes itself, see, through uh, individual contribution and effort. And uh, that way uh, everybody can kind of develop, you know, and uh, they're developing their own uh, sense of musicianship, too, because they have to make their own choices and decisions, you know, musical decisions. You know. I think we got Which a lot. gives me ideas, see? 
because I can't think drums like Elvin Jones. I can't think bass like uh, Jimmy Gass. You know, I can't think piano like McCoy. You know, I can't do it. They, they know more, much, much more about those instruments than I do, much more. So it's better for me to not, you know, try to impose too many of the things my ideas on them. But the band was used to that, and this is the way they worked best. McCoy Tanner. I think he had a very, very uh, uh, wonderful theoretical mind. I mean, in other words, he was a, a naturally scientific mind, I think he had. But not to the point where he would sit down and verbalize about everything, and this is going to be like that, and that's, you know. He said very little about what he wanted. He, if he had some certain specifics that he wanted, uh, wanted to uh, add to the music, or a certain way he wanted it, wanted it in terms of the melody, how he wanted it played, he would say it. After that, it was just up to you to do whatever you felt was necessary to make it happen. You know, it, was, it wasn't the type of person that would sit down and dictate, do this, do that. To the musicians, this was just another date to cut music for Train's label, Impulse. They showed up at engineer Rudy Van Gelder's studio. He, too, expected the usual. They would come in here, for example, on a Wednesday evening at 7.30 in the evening, and uh, he would teach him the, the tune, the other members of the group. He'd play it, demonstrate it, say what he wanted. They'd make one or two takes. I'd, I'd record it, make a playback tape for him, and he go, would go home, and that was it. And that went on over a period of time until he had enough, al enough to make an album. And that's how they used to do those records. This time, Train had a different plan. They were going to record the whole thing in one night. That wasn't the only surprise that night, according to McCoy Tyner. I remember something very unique about that recording, is that uh, Rudy, he, he turned the lights down. They were on, but they were low. And I, I guess, I don't know if he wanted to set a mood or whatever, you know, he sort of, I'd never seen, seen him do that. We didn't know exactly what was going to happen. And that's why that music was, I think, so important, because it was a on-the-spot, improvised situation. Um, honestly approach music. And the music came first above everything else. McCoy Tyner on piano, Jimmy Garrison on bass, Elvin Jones on drums. Here's John Coltrane. Then you can go into it later. Well, I think it'd be better to keep it pissing so we okay. we, we keep, keep, okay. a, keep you know keep a thing happening okay. all through. You know? okay. But you can go to it when you feel it later. You know? Ready? Acknowledgement, the first part of a love supreme.
You're listening to the making of a love supreme. I'm Mos Def. Major support for this program comes from the J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation, the Geraldine R. Dodge Foundation, and WBGOFM. Contributors include the Verve Music Group, home of the deluxe edition of A Love Supreme in record stores everywhere. Thanks also to Viking Books, publishers of Ashley Kahn's A Love Supreme, the story of John Coltrane's signature album. A Love Supreme is produced by WBGO, Newark, and Joyride Media. Producers are Josh Jackson and Paul Chufo. Ashley Kahn is the consulting producer. We also thank Leo Del Aguila and Carlos Asensio at NPR, Tara Gear, Good Tree Media, and WBGO General Manager Cephas Bowles. Our executive producer is Thurston Briscoe. I am most deaf. It's something that musicians dream about, to be able to make a record like that. It's like a dream, you know? It's nothing you can control. You can't will yourself. You can't just say, well, I'm going to make a record as important as this. It's just something that happens, and you're lucky enough to be there, or you ain't. Like John spent so much time preparing for that moment when it came, he seized it and knocked it flat. The combination of understanding of music, musicianship, the tradition, the technique, the whole thing. He was the entire package. That entire band was the entire package. Branford Marcellus is right. John Coltrane's Love Supreme is like nothing else. It's a message and every time you hear it, something new, something fresh, something beautiful catches your ear. But how do you describe it? It's very hard to do, maybe even impossible. John Coltrane was daring. He had the courage to show his private feelings to the entire world. Just read the liner notes of the album, a poem for God, true humility without fear. Coltrane was devoted to God and devoted to music. His quartet was at the top of their game, and Train was ready for more. He was on the edge of moving to very new territory. For the first time, we'll hear the seeds of that change in a rare sextet recording of a part of Love Supreme and the only live performance of the suite. We'll get a little closer to John Coltrane and the making of Love Supreme. I'm most deaf. A studio in New Jersey, December 9th, 1964. John Coltrane gives his band a few ideas. What they played was up to them. Engineer Rudy Van Gelder turns down the lights and producer Bob Thiel gives the cue. The tapes are rolling. If you say I love Supreme, it's that first chord. When that chord hits, we're walking. When we reach the main entrance where we can walk into this beautiful sacred place, the doors start to open. Alice Coltrane's image of the doors opening brings to mind another story. Picture a very young John Coltrane standing in front of the church doors in High Point, North Carolina. The doors start to open, and that's the church's invitation to join them, to be a member. Young Coltrane walked right in. Ashley Kahn just wrote a book about the making of a love supreme. He hears a whole service in it. In shape and in sound, even in its spirit, a love supreme suggests a ceremony. I mean, it starts off with a benediction, sounds like a welcoming, the uh, very opening of acknowledgement, and it goes through these incredible, passionate moments, these holy rolling moments of energy, high energy. And then slows down to more meditative moments as well. And then it ends with a very calming psalm which is straight out of a hymnal, basically.
Let's hear Coltrane's invitation to us to join in his experience. I love the green, 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 I love the green. That's Train chanting right there. Saxophonist Wayne Shorter loves it and remembers. Uh, using the voice, um, I think he was going back to a square one where um, the voice is the first uh, announcement of the, and your, your humanity, which includes uh, being our instrument. Acknowledgement. You're listening to the making of a Love Supreme. I'm most deaf. Besides its really dramatic opening, resolution stands out from the other three sections of a Love Supreme in many ways. Writer Ashley Kahn. First off, it's the only tune, the only section of Love Supreme that we have evidence of it being performed in a nightclub beforehand, three months before at a small nightclub in Philadelphia. Very exciting performance of it, over half an hour long. It's also the only tune that required the quartet to try multiple takes and really gives us an indication of what it was like to fit this tune and fit the music together in the studio. The new Verve Deluxe edition of A Love Supreme is a couple of those takes of resolution. Did that slow down? We're all pretty used to how the original sounds, but all of these sound good to me. Train could have put another version of this tune on the record and I wouldn't have complained. But he knew exactly what he wanted and it made engineer Rudy Van Gelder's life easier. When it came to making decisions about what were the good takes and whether this thing was being successfully recorded, he knew when it was right. He had a command of his own music and he knew what he wanted to the extent that he could say, oh, that's a good take. Now, that's not always possible and I admire musicians who can do that, but he had a way of knowing when it was right. That's what I remember about him the most. He could decide when it was good. Thank you. 
Resolution, Coltrane on tenor sax, McCoy Tyner on piano, Jimmy Garrison on bass, Elvin Jones on drums. You're listening to the making of A Love Supreme. I'm most deaf. Train decided many years before that Elvin Jones was the drummer he wanted, and it paid off. They were a great team, like a jab and an uppercut, a one-two combination, if you will. You can hear them swinging on part three of Love Supreme's Pursuance. Jazz researcher Dan Mortenstern. Well, there was a kind of uh, telepathy between them. I mean, they'd worked together so well that uh, Elvin, who, who is remarkable, his uh, dexterity, the independence of limbs, Elvin is, is unique in this way that he can set up so many different things at the same time. So with Coltrane, who's music is very intense and rhythmically complex and in a way can be unpredictable and Elvin just not only follows him you can't say who is the leader and who is the follower they're, they're so entwined Thank you. 
bassist Jimmy Garrison. This is the making of Love Supreme, Amo Stuff. Dan Morgenstern. It's not a matter of momentary, impulsive, you know, inspiration. It's something that must have had a period of gestation over time. And uh, because of that, I think more than any other single album, certainly, it represents a kind of distillation of of the man's uh, spirit. Because almost everything that was in him at that point in time is there. There's both the reflective and calm and serenity is there and the intensity and the ecstasy. Chain was intense all the time, fast or slow. Some, the last part of a love supreme is calmer than the others. It sounds like you're listening to someone praying. Thank you, God. Peace. There is none other. God is. In the liner notes, Coltrane wrote a poem called Love Supreme, and he sang the poem through a saxophone. God is all. Help us to resolve our fears and weaknesses. In you, all things are possible. Ashley Khan wrote a book about the making of Love Supreme. Here's what he has to say about song. Titling the last movement song, obviously that's an overt reference that Coltrane and many of his listeners were going to know. I mean, it's the Bible. And what Psalms is, is 150 songs of praise to God within the Bible. But that's not the only reference. I mean, within the poem itself, there's certain biblical language that Coltrane is drawing upon. He is gracious and merciful. May I be acceptable in thy sight. I have seen God. John Coltrane plays the sermon on song.
John Coltrane was still thinking of new sounds and new ways to play them. The day after playing these last notes of A Love Supreme, he came back to the studio to try it again. You're listening to the making of A Love Supreme. I'm most deaf. Major support for this program comes from the J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation, the Geraldine R. Dodge Foundation, and WBGOFM. Contributors include the Verve Music Group, home of the deluxe edition of A Love Supreme in record stores everywhere. Thanks also to Viking Books, publishers of Ashley Kahn's A Love Supreme, the story of John Coltrane's signature album. This is the making of A Love Supreme, I'm Ostaff. Tennis saxophonist Archie Shep gets a call from John Coltrane to come into the studio on December 10, 1964. He was a young man in a room full of veterans, Coltrane Quartet and bassist Art Davis. Train talked a little bit about the tune and they hit acknowledgement, the first part of A Love Supreme. I think it's apparent in, in, in what I play that um, I'm overwhelmed, but uh, I'm in the presence of a man who's, for me, within the context of my musical system, has had at that point, he'd exhausted all the possible avenues, all the frontiers. He was a Stravinsky, uh, and I was a novice. And, uh, I had to sort of try at least to rise to the occasion. Uh, I think at least on the fir first take, I did. Um, I did something interesting even to me now uh, as I listen to it. But, uh... The only tapes of this sextet session, two versions of the same song, were only recently found. Then his saxophonist Archie Shep. Train was like he was the big brother. He was an elder figure, and so uh, the things he expressed uh, were very personal to him, and uh, I think were appreciated by us all because he he, he lived that way. He was that's who he was. But uh, uh, it's to his credit that, uh, uh, like a, uh, any wise elder, he he allowed the the younger men to 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 go their way, to perhaps there were things that, that's why I think he, he, he liked the young people around him, because they constantly refreshed his own uh, concepts so that he didn't become too, too comfortable with the love supreme. John Coltrane was more lyrical. Archie Shep pulled all sorts of souls from his horn. Shep made many important records over the years, always keeping up a fire and intensity that you can hear on this early session something comes off that is really radically different from what John is doing. And 
I, he didn't want me, he didn't want me to play what he played. I don't I don't think that. That's why he asked me to, to be on the date. The second take is even more unusual. No one would hear it on the final release of A Love Supreme, though. John Coltrane. Well, the first part of it, uh, Archie Shell played on it, and I think I had another bass on there, but I, I didn't use this this part because I had I had two parts. I had one part that I was singing on, and I had another part that Archie and the other bass was on. And when I and editing editing, and I, I felt that I wanted to use the part that I. And, uh, uh, the singing, obviously. Train kept experimenting with that sound. He'd heard something new, beyond the quartet, and everything began to change, including the way he played tenor. You can hear the difference seven months later on a recording of the only live performance of A Love Supreme by the Coltrane mm. Quartet. At the Antibes Jazz Festival in the south of France, most of the audience hadn't even heard of Love Supreme. The record came out months later there. Even if you know Love Supreme very well, this live set is unusual. The solos were much longer, and sometimes it didn't seem like the band knew what Coltrane was doing. A lot of very fierce sounds are coming out of his horn that day. There are inspired parts, like the duet between Train and drummer Elvin Jones during Pursuance. Journalist Michelle Delorme is right there in the crowd and remembers. 
Well, uh, the performance was really incredible in, uh, in power. He played only 48 minutes, but uh, those 48 minutes were really, really, really a thunderstorm. Uh, and the, the, the audience was not ready to, to, to accept su such music. And after the concert, there was, you know, uh, not riots, but uh, uh, verbal, uh, you say verbal fights mm -hmm. between people, you know. Uh, um, a third of the audience uh, was yelling because they didn't like it. Uh, another third was yelling because they wanted more, because they thought 48 minutes was not enough. And uh, uh, a third, uh, the last third, was yelling because they loved it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ce concert est donc terminé. That's Demain right. soir, vous pourrez retrouver John Coltrane. Bon. Elvin Jones says that's just the way it was at a live show. People always reacted very, very, you know, very strongly. Either they they would throw a brick at us or, or, th or, or throw kisses. <laughs> it's either a tomato or a kiss. <laughs> Coltrane got these audience reactions everywhere, especially for A Love Supreme. The record came out in the States in early 1965, and people took sides. Joel Dorn was a DJ at WHAT in Philly at the time. Back then, from the perspective of a jazz radio station, the audience was either pro-train or anti-train. There was I never heard anybody say, yeah, train, yeah, he's all right. You know, you take him or leave him. Either you dug him or you just didn't get it. So every time one of his records came out, the phones would light up, you know, from the train fans. Are you going to play the, going to play the whole album tonight? You know, say, I, I understand. Or you would get this, you're not going to play that crap by John Coltrane, are you? It's not even music, you know, so... Jazz fans are very famous for drawing lines in the sand, and in this case, it didn't matter if they did. A Love Supreme started to spread further than the jazz world. Dan Morgenstern. But then there were people who had no particular background in jazz at all who were attracted to that music. And I think at the time, it would, with people who were into rock music, uh, somehow may have found a, a certain... Uh, kind of entry, you know, into Coltrane's music that some of the older jazz listeners you know, shut themselves out of. After A Love Supreme, Coltrane's pace of trying new things tripled. You either kept an open mind or you were left behind. The first big example of this is Ascension. transition. First meditations. Selflessness.
than Kulu Samama. meditations. The feeling and the sound of the music got more and more alien to what people were used to hearing. Bassist Ron Carter heard the same cold train underneath it all. Well, I, I don't think John broke any rules. John would play, he played form, you know, he, he played changes. He had a drummer going chain, chain, a lane, chain, a lane, chain, a lane, chain, a lane. And Jimmy was going bang, 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 playing time. And he, I, I don't see him breaking the kind of rules that the Arvin Carters were trying to break. They had melodies. Mm -hmm. And he played, with, he played around with these melodies. If you listen carefully to his second or third course, he's still playing a melody in some form or fashion. I'm not sure I'd call him a lyricist, but certainly he was a, a conformist to the form of music. And whatever he played, there was a logic and order to it. Well, let's test it. Here's Coltrane playing Body and Soul in 1960. Here he is playing it in 1967. Recognize the melody?
Young musicians in the mid-60s were taking Ornette Coleman's and Coltrane's ideas and trying to make new standards for music. People called their movement the avant-garde. Bassist Ron Carter sees little connection between Coltrane and the avant-garde himself. Well, I think he didn't fit in that category, that broad category of free, because he had a band playing chords, changes, rhythm, cults, and it seemed to me the avant-gardists, to make a word up, were determined, were determined to be freer from those kinds of boundaries as they could humanly be. I think what, what may have attracted them to John was his sheer skill level, consistency of bringing it to the bandstand every night, to the energy level and the intensity and devotion and ded dedication of John and his music to the band showed every night. As time went on, Coltrane's music became more of a mystery. Branford Marsalis doesn't see much of a mystery. I think ultimately what happened was that he was trying to get to the next place and he didn't have anybody to take the trip with him. And uh, it's too bad. It's too bad. It would have been interesting, you know, if he could have found them. Dan Morgenstern. He wasn't really at peace with himself, certainly not at a, as an artist. I mean, he always, he's always looking for something else. He's always looking there in Love Supreme, there is that moment of almost of serenity, of having found that. But of course he couldn't stay there. No, it was not his nature, he couldn't stay there. Alice Coltrane. He once had composed a very beautiful piece. You know, I was listening to it that evening, and I said, oh, this is beautiful. The next evening, I'm listening for this piece now. And so I asked him, I said, what happened to the piece that, that you were you playing so well that you had just composed and it was so beautiful? What, what has become of it? He said, that was yesterday. Coltrane was still experimenting with music in 1967. He had just taken up the float, was playing a lot of percussion, and planned to study Indian spiritual music with Ravi Shankar. He never got a chance. Poet Mary Baraka. Well, I heard a record, Dola Tunji Center, and like all artists, he went off in different directions, some less fruitful than others. Uh, when you hear this Ola Tunji piece, it's very hard to listen to that, but you have to listen to it. I guess that's what people must have said about Beethoven's knife. You know, <laughs> say, I can't listen to that, I can't listen to that. But at the same time, you're drawn to listen to it because as because Train was dying. You know, that he was holding his side every day then. And so what you hear actually are, are screams of pain and agony on that record. You know, that's what you hear. Ah! But the but the point is that there is information. I mean that might sound cold and statistical. But there's information in those cries. There's information in those, those screams. There's the experience of a great artist. And so you have to listen to it. And finally, you will get used to it. And probably when you do get used to it, your head will be bigger. <laughs> One of the lines in Cold Chain's Love Supreme poem was, I have seen God. Many religious people believe that's a sign that you're dying. In July of 1967, John Coltrane succumbed to liver cancer, his bandmate, Elvin Jones. I met him in Denver, Colorado, and we, we were together for the next six years. And, uh, it was a, a, a beautiful experience, uh, educational, uh, love, uh, spiritual, uh, you know, whatever, you know, everything that, that I think is, is good about you know, being associated with other human beings was there. Cousin Mary Alexander. John wrote his own epitaph through his music, and no one had to really 
you know, write anything to put on his, his grave because he did it through his music. He never felt he was perfect or anything like that. And he was always trying to improve himself and his music. statement can say it all. The lasting effects of Love Supreme are felt many, many years after it was recorded. Carlos Santana reflects on John Coltrane. Being a teenager at that time uh, with the war in Vietnam and, and all the riots and everything, it just felt like uh, everywhere you went there was like um, a lot of darkness. A lot of anger, a lot of fear, which is darkness. You know, the 60s was was very loud darkness. But somehow when I heard his music, it just felt like his horn was putting holes on the darkness. Well, he put a hole, you know, on man's collective ignorance. And he brought in a lot of light. It's the language of light. It, it ain't easy being on this planet. You know, and it's not easy to put your demons on a leash. But when you hear Love Supreme, it makes it way easier because you got Coltrane. At the 2001 Grammy Awards, Santana, who was supposed to announce the winner of the Song of the Year, opened the envelope and declared, the winner is John Coltrane, a love supreme. Though the award was meant for the rock group U2, the audience applauded wildly because it was true. The winner is John Coltrane and a love supreme. Today, Countless rockers, hip-hoppers, jazz players call it the Bible, the vision. Music lovers of all types embrace Love Supreme as one of the most important recordings of the 20th century. If you know the music already, then you know. If you're just getting to it, then you will know and welcome. Train's Vision, this signature beautiful album, holds the power to speak musically and spiritually to us all. Major support for this program comes from the J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation, the Geraldine R. Dodge Foundation, and WBGO-FM. Contributors include the Verve Music Group, home of the deluxe edition of A Love Supreme in record stores everywhere. Thanks also to Viking Books, publishers of Ashley Kahn's A Love Supreme, the story of John Coltrane's signature album. A Love Supreme is produced by WBGO, Newark, and Joyride Media. Producers are Josh Jackson and Paul Trufo. Ashley Kahn is the consulting producer. We also thank Leo Del Aguila and Carlos Asensio at NPR, Tara Gear, Good She Media, and WBGO General Manager Cephas Bowles. Our executive producer is Thurston Briscoe. For all of my friends in Brooklyn, Newark, and all across the world, I am most deaf. One love and peace. <laughs>